Hi friends, hope you are doing well. I'm Dr. Ganguly. Welcome to my channel. So today I'm going to make a video about how to write a postdoc proposal. And essentially, though I have made a video previously about writing a research proposal, there is some fundamental difference between a postdoc proposal and a research proposal. So essentially, a typical research proposal is written by professors at universities, and these are primarily written to get large grants. So, for example, these proposals may be written to national bodies such as the National Science Foundation, the Departments of Science and Technology, the National Institutes of Health, and so on, and also sometimes to big corporations, for example, Microsoft, Boeing, or Google. And the aim here is to solicit money for doing a lot of research. So, a lot of this proposal is about how much money they are interested in. It could be in the range of millions of dollars and so the primary focus is on the grantsmanship and on getting these numbers right. Now when you write a research proposal for example for the Humboldt Foundation or the JSPS or Fulbright or Banting or the Swiss National Postdoc or any such body then the objective is somewhat different. You simply want to get the stipend and the airfare and other benefits which are provided to you for availing of this postdoc. So the objective is limited and in fact the proposals I have written for postdoc did not have any mention about the money required and so on. These are of course provided by the institution itself in terms of stipend. So let's look at the basic outline. So the first thing you need to do is you need to take a very good look at the guidelines which are provided about the proposals. So very often the proposal is limited either in terms of number of pages or in terms of number of words or even sometime in the number of graphs and plots you can give and also in terms of the font sizes you can use and so on. So always make it a point to stick to that because the people who are getting these applications are very busy and they do not want to read a 10 page proposal if the page limit is 6. So if the page limit is 6 pages stick to the six page limit. Now the other thing of course you must do is that if the page limit is six page do not write a four page proposal or a two page proposal because that may be considered somewhat casual. Now let's start at the outline of the proposal. The first thing you need to do is write an abstract. So this is required in many proposals. This is about 100 to 200 words and this should be something which summarizes the entire proposal. So this is like a short summary. It should often be there. And sometimes this is the part of the proposals that gets read by almost all the people because once the abstract is read, people read beyond it provided the abstract is sufficiently interesting in terms of the research problem. Now the next part is the body of the proposal. And in this body of the proposal, you are going to answer two very important questions which I'm going to discuss next. So the first question is, why is this research important? And this is the part where you need to clearly mention the current state of the art in the field and who are the people who have worked in the field. And you need to cite a few references here because these references tell the people who are reading the proposal that this is the current state of the art and all this then leads to the research gap. So this is something you find out by doing a literature survey in any given area. You do a literature survey in the field and you find out a research gap. So to give you an example, when I was working on the problems of rotorcraft dynamics, then one of the things we always had an issue with is what happens when you sweep the blade at the tip. So essentially, if you have a rotor blade, if you sweep the blade at the tip, certain changes happen to the frequencies. And so there was a gap in the literature about what happens to the rotor blade frequencies if you have a tip sweep. So that would be something which comes out by a literature survey on the dynamics of helicopter rotor blades. So this is the research gap. Now the next issue is how do you fill this research gap? So that is where the fundamental question comes in as to why this research is important. And here you could give many possibilities. You could say that an experiment needs to be conducted. That of course is often the best possible solution but the experiment has to be conducted in terms of creating some mechanical system equipment and then doing a test, doing a rotor rig test and so on. And this is a substantial effort. 
So very often what happens is that that kind of research can only be funded in a large university or organization where you do have those facilities. So one more possibility could be that you are going to do some sophisticated three-dimensional modeling in computational mechanics, which is going to tell you what is the frequency when you sweep the tip of the rotor blade. So the type of project you propose, of course, will be dependent on the fellowship you are applying for. If you are applying for many fellowships at small universities and institutions, then it is sometimes easier to put forward a theoretical or a computational framework because these things are there. However, if you are applying to a certain place where they have a lot of equipment, where they are amenable to the idea of doing some big test and so on, then you can put that also there. Now, this essentially leads to your hypothesis question. And the hypothesis is something which you are propounding at this stage. It is something which you do not know, but which you are thinking to be correct. For example, the hypothesis in the rotor dynamics problem is that when you sweep the tip of a rotor blade, the frequency changes substantially. Because remember, only if the frequency changes substantially and that's coming out of your literature survey, are they going to be bothered to fund your research? Because if the frequency changes substantially, it's going to have an impact on the dynamic phenomena. It may lead to situations where there is catastrophic failure of the helicopter, which is certainly not something which many people would like to have. So again, your hypothesis should be something which is coming out of here and which you generally have an inclination of that this is going to be correct. So this is something which is very important. Now, to give you a different type of example from a different field, let us consider the situation in agriculture. For example, we have seen a lot of research which says that olive oil is good for health and many people in European countries have done research on that. So maybe you are somebody who now wants to look at the possibility that mustard oil may be good for health and maybe the part of the world you are coming from, there are a lot of people who grow mustard, who use mustard oil for cooking and you find that these people are also living till 80 or 90 years of age. So maybe this is a content gap which you want to look into. So this kind of content gap of course means that your hypothesis is that mustard oil is good for health and so you need to then devise a research strategy which will prove this. So this is the kind of idea which comes out in the part of your proposal which is essentially pointing out why the research problem is important and what is the research problem, what is the hypothesis. Now the second big question which you are going to have in your research proposal is how do you intend to do this research. So this is where your method section comes out. This is very often the biggest section of the proposal. So here you need to give the information about how you are going to collect the data, how you are going to analyze the data, and this completely depends on the field. So it's very difficult to give any generic prescription here. The general paths of research are that you could collect a lot of data, you could do statistical solutions to various problems. You could probably do mathematical modeling in some cases. You could do computational modeling in some cases, and you could also do experiments and case studies and so on. So depending on your field, the way you address your research problem is going to be very different. There are going to be experiments, techniques, statistics, research strategies, and so on. And that is the basic idea about how you are going to do your research. Now, of course, how are you going to say what is your method without even having done it? Now, the concepts you get are from your literature survey because if you have read a lot of literature, let us say about frequency measurement and prediction for different engineering structures, then you know some of the important things or some of the things which these people have said. For example, how they are going to do the computational modeling. Are they going to use the typical methods which are out there in the literature and so on, how they are going to do experiments. So based on those things, you can also propound your own method in this particular method section. Now typically this method section ends with the timetable of research and so this is the timeline. So if you are asking for a one year grant, for example, from the Humboldt Foundation, then you need to give out what you are going to accomplish at least at the end of each quarter and preferably you can give it at a monthly level. So 
again certain things need to be done immediately and then that follows something else and so on so that is the basic timeline of the work you are going to do so maybe you are going to spend one month in collecting data you are going to spend three months in doing statistical sampling and calculations then you are going to spend a few more months in doing various mathematical modeling various case studies and writing and at the end of the period you are going to write a paper or a couple of papers at this so that could be the typical product which comes out of a postdoctoral research type of situation so this timetable of research is very important because this lets the people who read the proposal figure out that you have actually contemplated about how you are going to do this problem and you are going to finish it now the next section is the result section and sometimes it's the results and outcome section so now the important question is how do you know what results are going to be if you have not done a thing till now so again here your literature survey comes in handy because you have read many papers and you have seen how the results and discussion sections in these papers have panned out so from here you can predict some of the results you are going to obtain for example if you were going back to that rotor blade frequency problem you are going to do various tests and then you are going to create graphs or tables based on the levels of sweep you give to the blade at the tip the different angles there and the frequencies you are going to obtain in hertz and so this is the main result which is going to come out of your work either you are doing, going to do it in experimental form or you are going to do in computational form and so these are the kind of things which you need to give out here and this is certainly going to help the committee to figure out whether you are going to be actually able to get these results in the time that has been given to you so one of the important things of course uh, is to make sure that the result section is very clear that you give something about the outcomes in terms of tables in terms of figures which you are going to get at the end of the postdoc you are doing and so at the end of this section you essentially conclude that the research is going to clearly prove that the particular hypothesis which you have advanced in your proposal is going to be correct so that should be the plan at this stage now do remember that whenever you propose a research proposal in a postdoc you're not 100 percent tied down to it this is a proposal because you do not know at the time of writing the proposal as to what is going to be the outcome of the proposal so what happens typically is that the work may slightly deviate from whatever you have proposed but one of the things which happens when you write a proposal is that a certain kind of thinking has been put down on paper and so you have a clear idea of the things which you are going to do for the one two or three years you are planning to do the postdoc so this is something the selection committees like to see because they are paying you money and therefore they want to make sure that the outcome of the project is going to be successful and also they are going to make sure that you are the person who is going to be able to do this particular project so at the end of this result section most of the time there is a reference section sometimes there are appendix sections and so on and then you end the proposal so essentially if there is a lot of graphical material or there are some tables which you want to give these often can go into the appendix section now in case you are planning to do some experimental work which requires money then you may need to add some of these things here or you may not add them you may just discuss it with your host and the host may say that you can use their lab now in my case whenever i applied for proposals such as humboldt or fulbright i had fully computational proposals so i was able to do all those things in my own personal computer or my own laptop so in those cases i had to take my laptop to that country do the work and then come back so essentially i did not need things from the host except for access to the library and the internet system there which let me get to the various journals and so on so sometime you may need some computing facilities and that of course the host is generally able to provide you so these are some of the point about the postdoc proposal again like i mentioned before it doesn't have too many things about grants here it's mostly to do about 
the research you're planning to do and what they are going to see is that is the research something which can be done within this period of time so sometimes people make a mistake of promising too much so people are then worried if this work can be done within one year and sometimes you may make a mistake of promising too less in which case they may feel that this is not worthy of getting the proposal so this is a very hard problem to solve you need to figure out this sweet spot or this optimal point where you have promised enough work that they feel that the proposal should be accepted and it's not too much also so that's the sweet spot here and also remember that most of the time the important thing here is that there should be a match between the skills you bring to the table the supervisor brings to the table and the problem itself so you are somebody who is actually going to be able to solve this problem with the help of the supervisor because the fundamental aim here is to make sure that the proposal you have proposed should be successful at the end of this period so i hope you enjoyed this video and you benefited from it if you have any experience about writing research proposals successfully or unsuccessfully for that matter please put it in the comment section and i will see you in a video sometime soon see you then